Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, a little bit about me. <coughs> Sorry about the coughing. Uh, I'm Ricardo, more commonly known on the internet as Lox. Uh, you can find me on GitHub and Twitter. I also uh, co-host um, a Portuguese technical podcast called Converses in Código and a monthly meetup called Porto Codes. If you go to porto.codes, you'll find a link to both of them. So if you're from around here, check it out. If you want to train your Portuguese listening, feel free to, to listen to the podcast. <coughs> I am also on the framework and learning core teams of Ember.js. And a bit later on, I'll talk a bit more about this and like <coughs> why it matters to, for what I'm about to say. So today we're going to talk about how Amber um, managed to not only survive but thrive in an era of uh, really strong hype cycles. But first of all, we need to have a common understanding of what exactly this means. So first of all, what's Ember? Ember is a JavaScript framework for building web applications. <coughs> it has a very strong emphasis on basically getting out of the way of the developer and providing tools uh, so that developers don't need to fret about the nitty gritty things of web development, uh, for example, routing. Um, which nowadays is a bit more taken for granted, but at the time that Ember came out, that it was the time that Twitter was experimenting with the hashtag routing that people really didn't like, and they went back to server-side rendering, and it was a big hullabaloo. <coughs> so Ember provides a lot of tooling out of the box. Uh, you can see here um, a couple of them, and it also has a very strong emphasis on shared solutions and providing a structure upon which you build your actual application code instead of doing the busy work of gluing different components together. So who uses Ember? Because Ember is a bit of a sleeper agent. A lot of people are using it, but uh, they don't talk about it, so people don't realize, but LinkedIn is uh, the biggest example. It's an Ember app. <coughs> not sure if the mobile app is native or not, but all of the web properties are Ember apps. And then we have Apple Music, PlayStation Store, both on the desktop and on the PlayStation itself, from what I've been told. Uh, BBVA also uses Ember, Conto. Th these two are our banks. Uh, and now for developer tools, we have Heroku. Uh, which is uh, servers, basically on demand, Travis CI, and then we have Hospital Run, which is a nonprofit project for uh, building basically a distributed uh, hospital database. And then we have this course, which many of you might have used. <coughs> so this takes care of the Ember part, so I hope we're good on that, but was the, what does hype cycle mean? So hype cycle is a phenomenon that was obser observed with technologies and their life cycle, especially like the successful ones because the ones that aren't successful usually uh, stay at one of the earlier stages. So we start with the technology trigger and this technology trigger can be one of many things. It can be, for example, a new platform, um, new capabilities, for example, touchscreens. The advent of touchscreens, especially on mobile platforms, really enabled a lot of new experiences, or just simply hardware that's better enough that it actually supports certain kind of experiences, let's say, VR or something really computationally um, intense. <coughs> so as, start, as people start um, using it and knowing about it, we travel towards the peak of inflated expectations 
And this is when people start thinking of a certain technology as a silver bullet and, oh, this will cure all my diseases and I won't have to worry about it ever again. But the problem is, as soon as you start using it, uh, uh, in practice, you start seeing its limitations and you start bumping your head on the wall and you go down, down, down to the trough of disillusionment. So this is the lowest point and it's when you're cursing the t technology and usually when people start looking towards something new already. But if nothing new is on the horizon or if for some org organizational reason you need to stick with it, then uh, you might eventually reach the, the plateau of productivity, which is when you are aware of the downsides and the advantages of that tool and you s can more easily focus on the task at hand instead of figuring out like, the tool and how to use that tool. <coughs> so a little bit more context on the um, front end. We have a series of hype cycles which is kind of known as like the JavaScript wars, the JavaScript uh, framework wars. And it's started, so these dates and these technologies are approximate because it's impossible to adequately represent, especially because, because JavaScript had a few years where it was very prolific and there was the meme that each day at least one new framework was showing up. So we start in 2006 with jQuery and the technology trigger for jQuery was that computers and browsers were getting enough performance that people were adding more and more interactivity, but the native technology, the native APIs weren't there yet, and each browser had very specific works, so you had to write a lot of code for the same feature to work the same across browsers, and it was still a bit cumbersome to search for elements, creating new elements, and all of that. So jQuery came on and leveled that, democratized a lot of the front-end programming that used to happen. <coughs> we have, below we have some alternatives that were also influential for the web. Uh, one of them, uh, MooTools, which is still uh, a reason that TC39 changes names for proposed APIs to JavaScript because MooTools has incompatible APIs, which is always fun for a tool that's like eight years old, which is dinosaur years in, in the JavaScript world. Then the next era came with Backbone, and Backbone, uh, we can say that it's the first of the single page application frameworks. And like all terms in uh, software, Single page application, or SPA for short, is a bit of a misnomer because it doesn't mean that it has a single page. What it does mean is that <coughs> after the first initial render of the page, every subsequent link that you click or state that's rendered is rendered in the browser. So the browser doesn't refresh and ask for the page from the, from the server and render all of that. It, asks for some information and re-renders using JavaScript. Uh, then we, ha we go to AngularJS, which is the first one, uh, but then React appeared. It was extremely vilified. If you were around for the first conference where it was presented, you could hear like just out loud laughing because it was basically HP, but then people got over it and they started to interiorize the architecture and the virtual DOM and its advantages. So it overtook Angular, especially because Angular uh, did a big no-no, which I will mention afterwards. <coughs> um, I've included a strange framework here, which is Batman. And this is for a specific reason. Most of you probably have no idea what this is. Um, Batman JS was a framework 
that was open sourced by Shopify, which is an American company, like a really big one, um, because they they were developing uh, they were developing it internally and using it. So they decided, oh, let's share this with the world. It has some cool ideas, but mostly it was infamous because it was implemented and. Uh, written in CoffeeScript. So if you wanted to use Batman, it was very suggested that you use CoffeeScript. <coughs> but you, you probably haven't heard about Batman because a few, uh, a few years, I think, one or two years after it was announced, Shopify uh, discontinued the project and announced that they were moving all of their properties off of Batman JS, so they removed a lot of JS codes. They moved again to server-side rendering, and if you were using Batman JS, this was really bad news because all of a sudden you have like almost no recourse. The project is still open source, the, even though the website disappeared and all of that. But there's still the re repository on GitHub but that's very fragile and it's no longer maintained. Basically, as soon as they announced this, they said, okay, the project is dead for us and I, I don't even know if it has um, any contributions, but I haven't heard of any fork. So it's effectively dead. Which brings me to my first point on how Ember tries to deal with this specific situation, which is governance. Governance is how a project is run. And, <coughs> sorry. For most open source projects, at least nowadays, it's usually one big company behind that's responsible for the project. And even if they have some like public way of the community having input into it, uh, usually the, there's a single company that's the, like the sole decider and can influence the framework however it wants. Ember, from the very beginning, uh, tried to avoid this because one of the <coughs> one of the founders of, of Ember.js, Yehuda Katz, came from jQuery, and at the time jQuery was already like very democratic governance because it was so big and involved so many people that they had to to come up with a strategy. So the way that Ember works is Ember has the concept of core teams. These are all volunteers, like, the, uh, like we saw in the presentation before, and there isn't even any Ember organization or one big company behind Ember. It's more like a a coalition of the willing, like whoever wants to contribute, contributes. Um, in terms of core teams, we have the steering committee. The steering committee is the group responsible for like the more administrative level of the project, like making sure <coughs> that the teams are cooperating uh, and taking care of logistics and operations and, and that sort of thing, like organizing EmberConf, uh, or organizing the roadmap process, which I will also mention afterwards. And then we have uh, the teams, the, the rest of the core teams, which is EmberJS or framework team, and they take care of the actual Ember.js framework, like that code. Ember data is the team for the library that takes care of data management in your app and making requests. So Ember data communicates with an API and it has a bunch of adapters and serializers, and then it integrates you with your Ember app. It's almost, if you squint at it really hard, it's almost like a Redux uh, for Ember because you have a central store and you can inject and it's, it's fun, it's good, you should try it. And then we have Ember CLI, which was at the time a bit controversial because it was the first CLI tool with a pipeline and generators and all of that. And at the time people were very much focused on, oh, I just want to put the script tag for jQuery and then 
script tag for my jQuery plugin and I'm done. And we, we were saying, okay, that's good when you're starting, when you have a demo, but as soon as you want something more professional, uh, our build pipeline provides you many more uh, <coughs> advantages. Like, we can provide you a much better development experience if you stick with, with our, our tools. And then we have the learning team. Um, this was specifically not named the documentation team because the learning team is responsible not just for the documentation, but the general experience of learning and handling Ember. This is purposefully very vague. Uh, and we ended up also taking care of the infrastructure. So <coughs> we have this, these teams, but it doesn't mean that to influence Ember, you have to be on one of these teams. I like to view it as more who is ultimately responsible for something. Like, if you imagine Ember as a service, like who gets the call if the service goes down? So uh, we have had that kind of situation, like our documentation for some reason went down and we went and checked, it was a, an outage, we couldn't do much about it, but we've also had uh, security reports because Ember has a, a, a well-specified way for developers to communicate security vulnerabilities and it was dealt, it was all dealt through that channel by the, the core team. <coughs> so the core teams are self-managed. Uh, at the moment, the process of how people get into teams isn't still super clear because uh, like things just happen usually. <laughs> And the teams, uh, I think something important is that sometimes people get the idea that uh, someone from above has the idea for a team and says, okay, this team exists and now we're recruiting. But historically, the opposite has happened. Like the CLI team, it was just a bunch of people working on the CLI tool and eventually, like they had regular meetings and all of that and it was a very useful tool and we decided to incorporate it in the ecosystem by default and so the team was basically officialized. So that's usually how it happens. The learning team was originally called the documentation team because there was a big effort on one of the, um, there was a major release of Ember and we wanted to update the guides. So we put together a task team to address it and then we stuck around and we had uh, regular meetings, et cetera, et cetera, and then we were officialized. So the people on the teams come from very different backgrounds. We have really super large companies like LinkedIn. At the moment, LinkedIn is a big slice of this particular pie because they're investing very heavily, uh, which is good for Ember in a way. And the fact, uh, later I will explain how we mitigate the possible like influences of so many of the car developers uh, being employed by LinkedIn. And we also have product companies, Tilda, which is uh, Yehuda's company. If you have a Ruby on Rails app, you should try Skylight, it's the product. And then we have Cardstack, and, and we also have consultancies like Code All Day, which is I think three, two or three people, so very small, Simp Labs, which is a bit larger, around t 10 people, and then at the par, I think it's in the hundreds. So this allows for various kinds of stakeholders, essentially, to cover a lot of bases instead of being just, okay, we're one company and we have this need and uh, we don't care about the rest. The teams, as much as possible, also have their discussions in public. We have a forum, uh, we have a Discord server. <coughs> uh, for some reason, the link, I copied the link wrong, but if you go to the emberjs.com website, you have a link to our Discord server there and invite, and we have weekly meetings. Uh, 
um, the CLI team, the data team, and the learning team usually have open meetings, so anyone can join. And they can listen only or they can participate. And we have agendas and then we publish the agendas and some notes uh, at the end of the meeting. <coughs> so, uh, we have the teams. How do the teams actually decide on features and etc.? cetera? Uh, the, first, uh, the first thing is the RFC process. So, the RFC process, RFC stands for Request for Comments, and it's fairly easy. Someone, doesn't matter if they're on a team or they just like Amber or something, they submit a proposal. We have a couple of templates with questions and sections for people to fill out. Then they try to find a champion from the respective team, and then um, the community weighs in. If there's a general agreement, we go to final comment period, which is a period of one week that can be renewed uh, every week until either there are no new concerns and we accept the idea, or uh, it's rejected because the concerns can't be uh, folded into the proposal. And then when it's accepted, then the implementation starts. This uh, RFC process has been proving very useful for Ember because it allows us to cover some blind spots that when the original author of the proposal wrote it down didn't see because we have access to even more kinds of applications from even more backgrounds. And this has been so useful that React and Vue.js both have the, uh, also adopted the RFC process and Vue.js is in the process for Vue 3.0. Related to this is the roadmap process. Oh, sorry, before that, here. To be accepted, it's based on consensus, and people usually think it's a voting, like, oh, uh, X votes Y, and the X votes yes, and Y votes no, but it's very consensus-based, and the difference is very nuanced, but while voting focuses on like the actual numbers of votes. The consensus model uh, at least has it, we usually practice it, is focus on the concerns. So if someone has a valid concern, we try to address it. The answer might be that we don't think it's a relevant concern or it gets folded into the proposal or um, something else, but we try to address uh, different concerns. Okay, moving on. Roadmap. Roadmap is run by the steering committee and it's another way to allow for the community to give input to the direction of the project. While RFCs are very contained to specific features, the roadmap is global to the project. It's like, okay, which of these features do you want us to work on? And if we're not working on it, what do you want us to work on? This was originally inspired by Rust, uh, which has uh, interesting connections uh, with Ember for a lot of reasons. But if you use Rust, crates.io is also an Ember app, yay. And we just finished, well, not finished, but uh, we just concluded the first part of the 2019 roadmap. So the year is a bit strange because it's like the opposite of FIFA's. FIFA's released the next year, the year before, and like we're in the year. So it's like we're, what we're gonna do the rest of the year, but we're already in, in July, like how that happens. But it works. <laughs> so the process consists of having a period where anyone can write a blog post and they tag it Ember.js 2019, and then we gather all of those blog posts, we do some analysis, we take some keywords, some topics, what is a community thinking about, 
um, what do they want to see, and we try to incorporate that into our vision of the future. So ultimately, the core teams have the last say because they're the ones that are responsible for the future of the framework. Uh, but we do try really hard to take into account the input from the community. <clears throat> so releases, how is like the actual uh, releasing of features? <clears throat> Ember has uh, actually four channels. There's the release channel, which is stable, beta, canary, and it also has an LTS. It follows a train release model, which is similar to Firefox and Chrome, which means that every week there's a new beta for the next version, and every six weeks there's a new minor version. Here. The LTS is the long-term support, and it's a bit special, uh, especially uh, among fr front-end frameworks, but we have two active uh, LTSs. One gets bug fixes and the other gets uh, security updates. <coughs> um, Ember major versions are very underwhelming because, <coughs> um, because we don't uh, have new features we actually do something different, which is on the current, let's say we're on Ember 2, on the current version, we deprecate and we implement the new features in a retro, in the backwards compatible way, and then on the next major version, we just remove the deprecations. So deprecations, we have documentation, like I'm, Here's an example for Ember 3.x. We already have deprecations for all of these versions. And like I said, what we try to do is instead of removing or implementing like new features in a way that breaks the framework, we try really hard to keep stability. And um, we implement the replacement API first, then the deprecation, and then we remove the deprecation. Uh, so this is the, the stability part, but how do we innovate within like all of these constraints? The first is standards. So Ember uh, bet really hard and re really early on on modules, class syntax and promises, history API with the, the routing. Routing is very central to Ember, so it was a big focus. We also tried to help with engine uh, benchmarking and then we have put out in the ecosystem a couple of ideas as well as we have borrowed some ideas. Uh, these are like the biggest upcoming ones. There are a lot of little nitty gritties that we have borrowed and lent to other frameworks, but basically Glimmer components are very inspired by uh, the React ergonomics and MobX has inspired how tracked properties will work in Ember. <coughs> so the problem with what I described is that in the same minor version, Ember releases new features and new features and new features and doesn't remove old ones. So what happens is that until there's a major version, a lot of like uh, alternative ideas cohabit the same mental model, and this is called a pit of incoherence. So to try to address that and to move the community all together to a, a new standard, uh, we've implemented additions, which is also borrowed from Rust. So the idea is that if um, a feature cannot be implemented in a backwards compatible way, we have an optional feature, which has the default value for keeping the same behavior, and then the new value, uh, when uh, the addition is released, will opt you into the breaking feature. So this is our way to guarantee that your current app will continue working, and if you start a new app, you get the new behavior. Um, I won't go into details about Ember Octane, but basically, 
these are like the maps. Everything in the right column has been implemented or is being implemented in Ember. Template only Glimmer components, for example, um, are under an optional flag because they change the semantics of having uh, just the template part of components. And the rest, like the class syntax, has been implemented. So whenever Ember Octanes, we will move all of the defaults to the ones on the right side. <coughs> so to recap, the ways that Ember tries to uh, address the uncertainty of hype cycles is with open governance, which guarantees that the project can keep going even if a certain section uh, drops away, uh, also similar to the previous presentation. Stability in the APIs through the train release model, the LTS releases, uh, everything is very um, predictable, and the deprecation workflow to help the users upgrade without sweating too much, we hope, along with code mods and all of that. And then through innovation, and this innovation can come through toolings, through contributing what we have found back to the community or through additions. So, obrigado. And you can find me at these places. Thank you, Ricardo.